Um, so we're going to go ahead with another one of our second, our last of the second year resident talks. Eileen Huang is going to talk to us about cerebral vasculitis in placoid chorioretinopathy. And I appreciate her stepping up here um, without a lot of notice and going ahead. Eileen, you're up. Oh, before one announcements. I want to thank Chet Shelley, A.J. Orman from Alcon, Suzanne Brox from Bausch & Lomb. Their support helps support lunch, breaks, and everything that you've enjoyed today. So if you see them out here, please thank them. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to talk about a patient uh, that I saw with uh, Dr. Shakur and Dr. Bell, so I want to give them credit as well as uh, I got some input uh, on this from Edward Quigley uh, in the neuroradiology department who may be related to one of our attendings here. Let's see. Um, so the patient was a 20-year-old female. Uh, she said that two weeks prior to her seeing us, she had sudden onset of a central vision loss in her right eye. Uh, there was a black spot in her vision. It didn't change or move uh, or grow uh, since it came on. She didn't have any eye pain. She hadn't injured her eye. Um, she also mentioned that she had some numbness on the left side of her body that started a few days before the vision changed, but that had gone away. She did not have any medical history. Um, she, her only medication was an oral contraceptive, and she was a university student who did not use drugs, and her review systems was pretty unremarkable. Uh, on her initial exam, her visual acuity was 2080 in the right and 2015 in the left. Um, her anterior segment exam was unremarkable without inflammation. And in her posterior segment, she didn't have any vitreous cell or haze, um, but she did have uh, these lesions in her uh, posterior pole. Uh, you can see that her optic nerves and her vessels are normal, but there are these uh, well demarcated areas of uh, RPE atrophy, as well as in the uh, central macula of the right eye, there's this yellowish, uh, placoid lesion that has uh, indistinct borders that likely you know, was responsible for her visual symptoms. Uh, this is a montage photo demonstrating the fact that there were also lesions in the periphery that were kind of atrophic as well as being uh, hyperpigmented. Uh, she had a few lesions in her left eye as well, down here and over here, posterior pole and periphery. On optical coherence tomography, uh, she had some disruption of her uh, inner segment, outer segment uh, junction, as well as uh, some <coughs> subretinal hyperreflectivity. Uh, so I'd like to um, ask the residents, or if Dr. Hoffman wants to pitch in with a differential diagnosis. <laughs> Just to clear that up. It wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> or Dr. Zog, who always knows the answers. So do you want to give us what we should consider in this case? Um, I was distracted. I apologize. Um, it looked kind of like a, almost like a serpiginous coming off the nerve in one eye. Yep, so it did look kind of close, and it's also kind of a geographic lesion. Uh, There's a lot of peripheral lesions too, mm -hmm. so um, it's pretty young for like a bird shot. Um, right, bird shot and multifocal choroiditis yeah. and panuveitis would also have those peripheral lesions. Uh, any of the residents want to chime in with what we all consider for every type of uveitis? Thank you, Zog, for answering again. But yes, syphilis, uh, sarcoid, and TB. <laughs> so uh, he hit on uh, Dr. Zog hit on a, a lot of good points. Um, he, uh, we should also consider uh, eels because anytime something looks like serpiginous, we got to consider that could be infectious related to TB, uh, VKH, uh, and also uh, AMP just because of the kind of placoid uh, nature of that central lesion in the right eye. Um, we talked about these, and also Bartonella can cause um, a chorioretinitis uh, that looks like this. So in additional testing, uh, now I'll ask the residents specifically, uh, what, what, what else would you like to get? Reese. Uh, clinic testing or lab testing or... Right, so FAA and ICG, that's, those are things we do for 
all these inflammatory diseases. Um, how about an MRI of the brain because she had some of that numbness? Do you want to? Let's do a uh, show of hands. Who does not want to do an MRI? Let's say maybe the numbness went away. Anyone not want to do an MRI? Raise your hand now. Okay. Uh, anyone who wants to do an MRI? Raise your hand. Okay, Dr. Mamelis. Okay, that looks like it's pretty much the consensus. Let's check out that numbness because that sounded kind of unusual. So here's an autofluorescence, and we can see that uh, those atrophic lesions correspond to hypoautofluorescence uh, in certain areas with some uh, stippled hyperautofluorescence. That one uh, poorly defined lesion on the center of the right uh, macula has some central hypoautofluorescence that's ringed by hyperautofluorescence and then more hypoautofluorescence. That has been described as a cockade pattern uh, in this specific uh, disease. Um, so this is the fluorescein angiogram. Uh, those atrophic appearing lesions uh, are basically turning out to be window defects with some uh, staining around the edges. And the central lesion is uh, blocking early and then uh, staining late, which is uh, kind of classic for active uh, chordal retinitis. On ICG, uh, there was hypo, uh, hypofluorescence corresponding to all the lesions. Um, there weren't any additional lesions spotted on ICG. Um, so we did get an MRI of the brain. Uh, I think the retina fellow who saw this patient was Jim Bell. So uh, he ordered the MRI to be done that uh, very afternoon. Um, and this is the diffusion-weighted imaging on the left, which demonstrates hyperintensity uh, of the bilateral pons. Uh, and there's a corresponding uh, dark hypo-intense uh, spot on the uh, parent diffusion coefficient imaging, indicating that uh, these were strokes, so they were uh, ischemic infarcts of her bilateral pons. So um, this, the read was done after the patient had left you know, the place where she got the MRI, so uh, Dr. Bell called the patient and had her uh, go to the emergency department, and she was admitted uh, for a stroke workup. Uh, they checked her for hypercoagulability, carotid, cardiac disease, uh, sarcoid syphilis, and TB, and everything uh, came back negative. Um, in consultation uh, with ophthalmology, they felt that her uh, central nervous system disease was likely an inflammatory in etiology, so they started her on uh, high-dose IV steroids, and they followed that with oral steroids. Uh, one week later, she had some additional workup. She had a lumbar puncture, uh, which was normal. Uh, she had a cerebral angiogram, uh, catheter angiogram, that demonstrated some areas of focal narrowing uh, and irregularity. Uh, this was present in multiple vessels in the anterior and uh, posterior circulation. Uh, we didn't find any uh, abnormalities of those uh, deep penetrating uh, vessels from the basilar artery that would have supplied her pons, but they may have been uh, too small to see. Uh, she had some additional workup for lupus, anaphospholipid antibody syndrome, uh, Sjogren's and ANCA-associated vasculitis, and this was all negative. Um, Dr. Shakur uh, injected an Ozerdex implant and started her on Cellcept uh, to control her ocular <laughs> disease. And uh, rheumatology uh, started her on rituximab for her uh, presumed uh, central nervous system uh, vasculitis. Uh, so the diagnosis uh, was felt to be um, a rare entity that you might not have heard of, which is a relentless placoid uh, chorioretinitis. So on uh, follow-up, uh, she did not have any uh, recurrences at three months, and she had a repeat cerebral angiogram that was normal, so her uh, rituximab was stopped. Uh, at six months, uh, she still was uh, doing well in terms of not having any new uh, lesions. Um, and that uh, previously uh, active uh, appearing lesion now looks atrophic with some hyperpigmentation in that area. Unfortunately, her visual acuity uh, didn't get any better, but she said that her central scotoma was subjectively less dark. Um, so uh, I guess at this point we should ask, uh, why is this case interesting? Um, you know, for those of us who are not necessarily uveitis uh, experts, um, but it's really important because it's one of those diseases that could kill the patient that we could potentially pick up by seeing a patient in the office when they present acutely with symptoms. So I think it's pretty important to know about uh, from that perspective. And then, you know, from a general knowledge perspective, 
uh, her diagnosis, uh, relentless plaqueoid uh, corneal retinopathy, has only been uh, reported in association with central nervous system disease uh, one previous time. And this is the first time that uh, a patient with this uh, relentless plaqueoid corneal retinopathy has uh, had a stroke and had proof of uh, cerebral vasculitis on angiography. So there is one uh, case reported previously in 2009 of relentless plaqueoid associated with central nervous system disease, uh, but that patient uh, just had headaches, uh, no focal uh, neurological symptoms, and they had flare hyperintensities on their MRI, but no definite evidence of stroke, and their uh, cerebral angiogram uh, was normal. So a little bit more about uh, relentless plaqueoid uh, corneal retinopathy. It was described really pretty recently, just in the year 2000, by Jones et al. Um, However, you know, we probably would imagine that this disease has likely been around longer, and upon looking back at older cases, uh, certain things that were described as recurrent uh, AMPI uh, probably fell in this category. Uh, it's also been called uh, ampiginous corneal retinopathy since it shares characteristics with AMPI and <coughs> serpiginous. That's kind of a, a mishmash of the two words. Its key characteristics are uh, posterior and peripheral retinal lesions that occur uh, before or uh, simultaneously with the uh, macular lesions. Uh, and it's also a progressive disease, uh, if untreated, in which um, there you can see older healing pigmented lesions, like we saw in our patient, together with new, uh, new active lesions that are, have hazy borders and don't have that hyperpigmentation. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the lesions can look kind of similar to ampi and serpiginous, and this, uh, share, this disease shares characteristics of both. So uh, I've put up photos here of uh, ampi, which is acute posterior multifocal plaqueoid pigment epitheliopathy, uh, and you can see these uh, yellow uh, plaqueoid lesions that are not very well defined. And then here's a patient uh, with serpiginous uh, choroiditis, where you can see geographic lesions extending uh, from the nerve. Um, the ways that relentless plaqueoid uh, differs uh, from these diseases is that it has uh, peripheral lesions early on in the disease, whereas ampi uh, almost never has uh, peripheral lesions, and uh, serpiginous usually only involves the periphery after there's extensive macular involvement. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, there's not that much known about the association between uh, relentless placoid and stroke. Um, so I thought I would look at uh, whether ampi and serpiginous have been associated. Um, and indeed, uh, there's a strong association between ampi and stroke. Um, there's been uh, numerous uh, cases published uh, where patients have uh, had neurological signs or symptoms such as headaches, hemiparesis, seizures, et cetera, that occur uh, soon after the onset of their ocular symptoms. Um, and they demonstrate um, commonly uh, MRI findings consistent with uh, infarcts, although you know, other things have been found as well. Uh, they usually have uh, CSF pleocytosis. Um, and on cere cerebral angiography, uh, stenosis and uh, vasculopathy have been demonstrated of both large vessels, like the middle cerebral artery, <coughs> and um, smaller vessels as well. Uh, this has been proven uh, on histopathology to correlate with vasculitis uh, in just two cases. Um, in the other cases, there was no histopath uh, available. As you can imagine, if a person develops ampi, you're not gonna biopsy their eye, but uh, there was one patient who passed away and they did um, on the autopsy uh, see definite ev evidence of vasculitis uh, causing those uh, strokes and uh, vessel irregularities. Um, AMPI is a pretty rare disease to begin with, uh, and the strokes associated with it are pretty rare as well, just one out of 18 in this uh, case series. And however, uh, the consequences of stroke associated with AMPI can be pretty severe. Uh, five out of the 28 published cases of AMPI associated stroke resulted in uh, death of the patient from the stroke. So this is really something that you don't want to miss and you want to catch early and treat because uh, cerebral vasculitis is uh, treatable. In contrast, uh, serpiginous choroiditis doesn't have any uh, systemic associations. Uh, it may be that you know, this indicates that relentless placoid may share more features with AMPI, but um, it's not uh, currently clear. 
Um, so the way the diagnosis of central nervous system vasculitis is made is by definitively by biopsy, but as you can imagine, um, biopsying the brain or the meninges is not something that we want to do unless you know, it's really indicated. Uh, and also, even biopsy has a limited uh, sensitivity. Um, if there is a cerebral angiography evidence of narrowing and dilation in multiple areas of multiple vessels, that's consistent uh, with the vasculitis, but it can also occur in, all, in other uh, vasculopathies as well, but can be used to make the diagnosis in the appropriate clinical context, uh, which is you know, what we did in this case. Uh, a few terms that um, are used I've seen in the literature um, vasculitis referred to as angiitis in this context. And I've, used, I've seen the word um, cerebral substituted for central nervous system just because usually it involves the brain. So central nervous system vasculitis can either be primary or secondary. In order to make a diagnosis of primary vasculitis, um, secondary causes must be excluded and, as well as uh, diseases that mimic uh, vasculitis on angiography. Uh, vasculitis of the central nervous system can be due to uh, atypical infection, systemic vasculitis, drugs or connective tissue diseases, as well as uh, sarcoidosis. Um, in addition, there are some uh, non-inflammatory vasculopathies that can appear similar uh, to va vasculitis on cerebral angiography with that uh, irregularity of the blood vessels, and this includes uh, hypercoagulable states and uh, SUSAC syndrome. Uh, in primary vasculitis of the central nervous system, the eye uh, or vision, visual pathway is often involved. Most of the time, it's due to the cerebral effects um, of infarction, such as affecting the visual fields, uh, but they can also be associated with optic neuritis and cranial nerve palsies. Um, I've just listed some of the uh, systemic vasculitides here uh, that affect the eye. Um, Kogan syndrome, giant cell, granulomatosis with polyangitis, Bichette's, um, and sarcoidosis, which is not a uh, vasculitis, but rarely uh, can uh, have vasculitis of the uh, central nervous system, but also does have um, retinal vasculitis. Um, some of the mimickers uh, that look similar to the vasculitides on angiography of the brain uh, include uh, lupus or antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, uh, but on histopathology, um, it dem uh, usually demonstrates that there's uh, vascular occlusion without inflammation, and I believe that's uh, what it demonstrates on uh, fluorescein angiography most of the time, although there may be some uh, leakage. Uh, SUSAC syndrome um, is another disease that's characterized by an <coughs> autoimmune-mediated arterial or occlusion uh, without uh, inflammation. So uh, this also uh, led me to wonder um, how the systemic uh, vasculitides were related to retinal vasculitides. Um, I've several times as a resident uh, received a consult um, to do specifically a fluorescein angiogram because um, a systemic vasculitis <coughs> was uh, suspected, and I've just wondered, you know, what is the evidence behind that? Um, it's also very curious, you know, when the primary team tells me they have no idea what the disease is, and they don't want me to, they don't need me to examine the eye, they just need me to do a fluorescein angiogram, because, you know, that's the only way they're gonna pick up their vasculitis without biopsying something. So actually, you know, systemic vasculitis is very rarely um, associated with retinal vasculitis. Um, as you know, you saw in that uh, listing of the systemic vasculitides, they're often associated with ocular uh, manifestations and inflammation, but not necessarily uh, retinal vasculitis. Um, why is that the case? You know, I think that the vasculitides are pretty specific in terms of which organs that they target, but also the way that we diagnose ret retinal vasculitis, which is by uh, leakage on fluorescein angiography, uh, which can sometimes be due to not an inflammatory process, but due to occlusion or other reasons, um, is different from how systemic vasculitides are diagnosed, which is by uh, biopsy and pathology, demonstrating vessel wall uh, inflammation and necrosis. Um, going back to the primary central nervous system vasculitis, retinal vasculitis has not been uh, reported in that case. So, um, 
going back to our case of relentless placoid uh, associated with uh, central nervous system vasculitis, uh, one wonders, you know, why do those occur together? And uh, similarly for AMPI, uh, there have been some theories uh, proposed for how um, the, you know, disease is of the eye is uh, caused by what, uh, what the etiology of the ocular disease is relative to the cerebral disease. Uh, so AMPI is thought uh, that it could be a disease of the choroidal vasculature uh, as demonstrated by the hypofluorescence on ICG. And also uh, there is some retinal vasculitis sometimes in AMPI and uh, sometimes serous retinal detachments that could be explained uh, by choroidal ischemia. Uh, so it could be that uh, this that AMPI is a disease that could affect the blood vessels specifically of just the choroid and the brain. Uh, there's only one uh, case in which, uh, that, which I mentioned on, upon autopsy that they did histopathology of the eye, and that didn't demonstrate any uh, vasculitis of the choroid, but it did demonstrate uh, gran granulomatous inflammation of the choroid. So um, I think our case uh, is really interesting. Uh, because it suggests that maybe there could be a link between relentless placoid uh, and the choroidal vasculature as well, but that uh, needs to be further investigated. I think that um, one technique that could be uh, really useful for both uh, relentless placoid and uh, for AMPI uh, would be OCT angiography, if that you know really improves our ability to look at the choroidal vasculature and could tell us whether you know that's really the fundamental uh, problem in these diseases. So just going back to um, a summary of what I've talked about, uh, relentless placoid is uh, a uh, posterior uveitis. It shares characteristics with both AMPI and serpiginous. Um, and both AMPI and uh, relentless placoid can be associated with strokes that are likely due to cerebral vasculitis. And that's something that uh, we as ophthalmologists, if we see someone presenting acutely uh, with a disease that could be this, we don't want to miss uh, because it's treatable. So we should um, you know, refer these patients for a neurological workup and uh, treatment um, as uh, indicated. And just you know, for those uh, consults that we get, I think um, it was interesting that uh, cerebral and retinal vasculitis don't often occur together. Um, except in the case uh, of Bichette's disease and some, you know, in viral infections. Okay, that's it.